We're five people from the Weather Underground organization. We're in a house. It, you could call it a safe house. We're here with a group of filmmakers, and together we're going to make a film. We're underground in this country. We've been underground for five years. Those of us here today are fugitives. We've been asked to come here by our organization to speak for the organization. My name is Jeff Jones, and around the table is Kathy Boudin, Kathy Wilkerson, Bernadine Dorn, and Billy Ayers. You could say that this screen that's between us is a result of the war in Vietnam, or as a result of racism in the society. It's an, it's, it's an act, it's an important act to overcome this, this barrier, and we're going to try to reach through it, talk through it. You know, the reason why we're underground is that we believe that we have to overthrow U.S. imperialism and replace it with a different society, and that's why we're underground, because it's going to take a long fight and the reason it's going to take a fight is because they're going to make it be a fight we we want to make a revolution we think there has to be a revolution many people think that we went underground because we had to go underground because we were fugitives and there's some truth in that but we also went underground because we believed in the, in the necessity for building an underground this was a move that was offensive it wasn't simply a defensive move and we feel like this is a very important thing to say because because most people think of underground as being like being forced like being forced underground hiding and, and we're and constantly on the exactly constantly, you know they're after you so that's why you went underground. you know we think of building an underground organization building an underground movement in that way we don't think of it as a particularly defensive action but think of it as a base to uh, study a base to think a base to survive a base from which to fight not just in the early stages where the fighting is small and selective but along the way as it develops and grows and as the fight becomes a really massive social upheaval we're a group of people who are committed to each other on a certain level we're committed to study studying with each other to arguing about what's right and what's wrong about deciding as a whole what to do and then going forward and carrying it out that's the only way we can find out whether or not we've what we've decided is right or wrong and in that, that's, that's the contribution that we have to make and that the, uh, that the revolutionary movement as a whole has to make to the people in this country. We all were produced by massive social situations. Um, our revolutionary consciousness was a result of growing up in the age of the atomic bomb by growing up in the 60s. We are who we are because Malcolm X was around teaching or rap brand. Um, we're trying to draw out our own particularity and yet we feel completely tied into the particularity of all these other struggles. That's the kind of web we're trying to spin. My name is Kathy Wilkerson. My political history began in 1962. I went to uh, a, dem a picket line outside of Woolworths in Cambridge, Maryland and heard Gloria Richardson speak. And for me, that was the beginning of realizing there was a struggle going on that had um, deep importance for everybody's life, um, and including mine. Uh, but I was still somewhat of a spectator until 64, when I went on a picket line against segregated schools in Chester, Pennsylvania, and was arrested for the first time and found out that even the jails were segregated. I say violence is necessary. Violence is a part of America's culture. It is as American as cherry pie. American taught the black people to be violent. We will use that violence to rid ourselves of oppression if necessary. We will be free by any means necessary. I remember really distinctly the day that I walked down a hall at, at school and there was a, a poster on the bulletin board and it was a leaflet that had been put out by a, a black community group in Chester, Pennsylvania that was fighting for integrating the schools. The word around was that people were going to be arrested. And I remember standing and staring at that leaflet and knowing absolutely that this was the time when I had to make a decision in my life. If I got arrested, 
I knew what the consequences were. I knew in terms of everything I had been programmed to do for the rest of my life. I hope I haven't put anybody on the spot. I'm not intending to try and stir you up and make you do something that you wouldn't have done anyway. <laughs> I pray that God will bless you in everything that you do. I pray that you will grow intellectually so that you can understand the problems of the world and where you fit into in that world picture. And I pray that all the fear that has ever been in your heart will be taken out. And when you look, when you look at that man, if you know he's nothing but a coward, you won't fear him. If he wasn't a coward, he wouldn't gang up on you. He wouldn't need a out. how they function. They function in mind. That's a coward. They put on a sheet so you won't know who they are. That's a coward. The time will come when that sheet will be ripped off. If the federal government doesn't take it off, we'll take it off. My name is Bernadine Dorn. One of the first uh, political things I remember growing up is watching the Army McCarthy hearings on television, watching my mother ironing day after day and watching these hearings. My parents were Midwest Republicans. They voted for Joe McCarthy. And it wasn't until eight years later um, that these ideas began to be really challenged for me. But I knew that taking the first step would change my life. And I hesitated for a long time. The first demonstration I took part in was an anti-HUAC demonstration. And then increasingly, I became involved in organizing work in Chicago and joined the open housing drives for equal housing rights that took place on the west side of Chicago in 1966. We're going to march with the force of our souls, mobilize bodies in concern for justice. And somehow we're going to step out here tomorrow. We're going to take the ammunition of determination we're gonna move out with the weapons of courage. We're gonna put on the breastplate of righteousness and the whole armor of God, and we're gonna march over this city. And this is it. Black people of Chicago demonstrated day after day and weekend after weekend by marching into neighborhoods that they were not allowed to live in all over Chicago. And what they elicited from these marches was the kind of blatant, open, violent racism that you see today in Boston, in any city in the United States. And uh, by this time, I was a law student, and I joined the National Lawyers Guild. At the height of the student movement, I joined SDS. This was long after I was a student myself. I was elected national officer of SDS and had the opportunity of meeting with the Vietnamese and the Cubans. This experience in particular made me a full-time revolutionary and really changed my own idea of myself and what the revolution was going to be. La revolución es un profundo problema de conciencia. La revolución es un profundo cambio de estructura social. Una revolución triunfa cuando un pueblo en su inmensa mayoría toma conciencia real de, de lo que es la revolución. Toma conciencia real de los cambios que se hacen y toma conciencia real de los objetivos que se buscan. Ser comunista no es solo tener una actitud intelectual, una actitud racional ante los problemas. Hay que tener un, un sentimiento en ese sentido. Hay que tener una vocación revolucionaria. Yo tenía la vocación revolucionaria. Si usted no tiene vocación, no es capaz. No tiene vocación, no es capaz de luchar ciertamente por algo. Yo recuerdo que el problema del imperialismo mismo lo entendía de una manera propiamente intelectual. Me pasa en cierto sentido como le ha pasado a muchos jóvenes norteamericanos que solo recientemente han tenido una percepción real de los problemas que les ha hecho tomar posiciones políticas determinadas. My name is Kathy Boudin. 
I grew up in New York in a family that was a left family and taught me a lot about the questions of justice and injustice in the United States. Even though I had understood a lot about the problems of the United States, if you only know the problems, you can become very cynical. And when I went to Cuba, I was very skeptical. I was very skeptical that a new kind of society would be possible. And there I felt the tremendous enthusiasm and possibilities and hope that socialism means for the people in Cuba and for people around the world. And I remember on January 2nd, 1960, 1961, I was 17 years old, standing in downtown Havana, surrounded by a million people, a million Cubans that had come to Havana to celebrate the Cuban Revolution. At the end of the six or seven hours of people celebrating came a long military parade with guns and weapons and tanks. I had been cheering along with everybody else. Suddenly I realized that I was cheering for tanks and for guns, which is something that was completely opposite to what I had been brought up to do. My Cuban friend that was standing next to me saw my eyes fill up with tears, and he looked at me and he said, I understand what you're feeling. We don't like to have guns and weapons either, but it's your country that makes us have to do this. Three months later, the Bay of Pigs invasion occurred, and I understood what he meant. My name is Billy Ayers. My political history begins in the student movement and the youth movement, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. In 1965, when the anti-war movement was just beginning, shortly after Johnson invaded Vietnam, Several of us who were students uh, made a decision, along with, I think, really hundreds and thousands of people at that point, that uh, the anti-war movement had to apply the tactics and the, and the confrontational methods of the civil rights movement. we've been uh, organized as revolutionaries, people, one of the main things that, that, that people have asked us is, uh, are upset to us, is that you, you can't win, it can't work. What, what can you accomplish? There's nothing we can do. This United States government is so powerful. Just think back two months, think back two years, think back five years. We used to chant, uh, right on, take Saigon, or ho, 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 chi minh, the NLF is going to win. Who believed it? Who could believe it? Who had, the, who had been educated? Who had the tools to believe it? It just happened. <laughs> U.S. imperialists have committed on our soil. Our entire people from north to south, close to united, have raised up to defend their freedom and independence. We are absolutely sure of our victory. Since our cause is just, we are strong with our entire people and with the growing support of the people of the world including the American people. Long live the friendship between the Vietnamese and the U.S. peoples. Nó dùng cái chánh quy mà nó đối phó lại với cái chiến tranh du kích đó. thì mà cái chiến tranh du kích là chiến tranh của nhân dân, của toàn dân. Là nó đưa cái chiến thuật nó là trực thăng dẫn. À, như thế là nó cơ động rất nhanh. À, để nó đánh à, lại cái lực lượng của cách mạng Chúng không ngờ rằng là à, Cái chiến tranh nhân dân á Thì lại là người ở tại chỗ à, à, Đánh nó Cho nên cái cơ động Dầu nó nhanh thế nào nó cũng không bằng à, Là cái chiến tranh nhân dân là nó đến đâu là đụng It's over. America can regain the sense of pride that existed before Vietnam. But it cannot be achieved 
by refighting a war that is finished as far as America is concerned. We are not going to let the war in Vietnam be over. Everything the U.S. had to throw at Vietnam was thrown. Technology, invasion, limited war, special war, search and destroy, hearts and minds, Vietnamization, everything. Break the will of the people, make the cost too great. And every one of those strategies was understood and a strategy was developed that let everybody in Vietnam participate in one way or another to defeat that strategy. Well, I think the, I do think that the most important uh, the most important lesson that people can draw from it is that people make history. That history isn't something that happens far away and and long ago. History is something that's made by people. It's made by Vietnamese people and it's made by American people. Tomorrow will only be what the people make it. This belief in people rather than in technology. We've all been taught to be jaded about, cynical about. Right. How could it possibly be, especially here in the middle of a technological wonder, you know? What you do doesn't make any difference. You don't matter. Um, and I think the revolutionary lesson is just the opposite. What people do makes all the difference. What people do or don't do determines the outcome of things. Well, the lessons of the war are subversive. I mean, and that's why they have to be covered up immediately. And that's why all the effort goes into reconstructing one false lesson after the other. I mean, a tremendous amount of energy goes into trying to bring back the POWs with a big brass band where there's no jobs for vets and no welcome. If you understand what happened in the Vietnamese War and why the Vietnamese defeated the United States, it makes the possibility and the inevitability of revolution in the United States very clear. The United States government is not invincible. It didn't exist for all time, and it's not going to exist for all time. It's full of weaknesses. You need this war, they said to the American people. You need this war in order mm -hmm. to have enough food, mm -hmm. in order to have housing, in order to have the materials that you need to have a good society. This war is going to bring this to you. And I think what people learned is that the war didn't bring those things. Who was it that made profits from the war and who suffered? Both political parties supported the war in Vietnam. Both political parties support the continuation of a war economy. That the cause of the war wasn't a policy or it wasn't a bad president or a bad string of presidents or even five bad presidents. People were forced over the years to see that it was the whole organization of the society and to call it something that we'd been taught all of our lives was just rhetoric and communist slogans, imperialism, capitalism. That's what it was. That's why we were fighting the war. And what starts to be revealed more and more with more and more suffering is that, of course, it's a class society here. Really no different subject to the same laws that you see operating in the rest of the world. And that lesson is a very powerful lesson. That lesson is, uh, is an explosive lesson for the people to grasp and make their own. The power belongs to the young people and the black people in this country. We're going to remake this country in the streets. Don't get hung up in this fourth party bullshit. Don't get hung up in peace candidates. Come on, we got to fight it out. Where the only power we can build is, that's the base. We got to build a strong base and someday we got to knock those motherfuckers who control this thing right on their ass. Came out of conditions that were genuine and the struggle was genuine the reality was genuine and had to make the transition from being a student movement and a resistance movement and a protest movement into becoming a revolutionary movement that was broader than students that took the student base and exploded it into the whole of the american people that was a change and a transition that demanded a lot of political maturity and most everybody was not adequate enough to make that transition without a lot of mistakes being made. We no longer simply resist the pigs. We no longer trap ourselves so that the only possible motion is in response to pig attacks. We have gone on the offensive. It is we who call the shots now. You tried everything that you could do you organized everybody you could do you became obsessed with it you put the pictures up on your wall protested and wrote and demonstrated and 
spoke in, I think it happened, Women Strike for Peace. It happened in a million sectors of the society that people stood out there and felt outrage. It was correctly called the Days of Rage and felt like we had to do more. We weren't doing enough. The American people were not doing enough. There were the Chicago police who knew us well and harassed us and followed us around and broke into our apartments. Well, we, we grew up and we didn't learn anything about history and we didn't understand very much about how you can't always see on the surface. What you see immediately is not necessarily what's at work and what's happening. And so growing up, everybody feeling small and isolated and made to feel that way their whole lives, we felt that way then, but we felt determined to carry out an action that would reveal how passionately we felt and that we were on the other side. <laughs> Not letting yourself be passively carried off by the Chicago police or fighting, being willing to fight, was a shocking idea and uh, didn't come naturally at all. I believe that there's a feeling among the people who participated in the Days of Rage, a commonality, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, because it was probably the most terrifying thing that any of us were ever involved in. Does that make us feel separate from other people who are not in the demonstration, who are not in the days of rage. It is the case that when it happened and in the period after it happened, there was that kind of feeling. Um, and it was quite a while ago. It was five years ago. That demonstration was six years ago, and it was five years ago that we understood that that was wrong, that feeling toward other people for not participating in it. See, I, don't th I, I would say that we weren't wrong to want to fight, and we aren't wrong to know now that you have to fight. But, and, and it's for a pretty simple reason, because what we saw by that point in time, and I think what a lot of people have, have reckoned with in themselves, is that to not act, to not do anything, or to not do as much as you can do, whatever it is, is uh, as violent as criminal, as complicit, as doing everything you can do. And some of it will be right and some of it will be wrong. And you'll have to change and do better. What right is anyone to walk down the street with a uh, chain in their hand or a club, which we saw last night used on the fleece, or an iron pipe? You know quite well that they're not uh, playing hockey with those kind of outfits unless they're playing hockey with someone's head. I think Graf Brown was right. Violence is as American as cherry pie, and this is a violent, bloody country. And, I mean, the people's violence is a teeny percentage of that. It's mainly the violence inflicted on the people. What, what the transforming experience is, is being willing to put your life on the line. And there was plenty of examples of that long before a lot of us, myself, ever figured out what was happening at all. Black students, armed black people, uprisings in every major city in the country. These were the results of the conditions. And of course, this had been true all along. It was just that a lot of people don't know that it's true all along. It's interesting because very quickly after the days of rage, around the country, it was as if a lot of people who were feeling as angry as we were feeling and feeling the need to express that anger at the state and to build the strength of the people's movement in this country did express it. All around the country, there were demonstrations that were very angry. It definitely wasn't just us. It was really much, much bigger. Not only was it not just us, but we weren't the first. And no. we, I mean, we didn't feel and don't feel right. like some vanguard line of this question of resisting the violence that goes on all the time. We feel like, and certainly felt like in the days of rage and by the time the townhouse happened, like we were running to catch up with the real, with the reality of the situation in the United States. 
Mary and I found in, uh, in looking at early footage of your group, an almost arrogant male posturing. There was a period of time when we put forward a vision of ourselves and a vision of revolution that was hard and mean and somewhat anti-human. You know, a one-sidedness, because revolutionaries and, and, and progressive people should be militant, but they shouldn't be militaristic. And they should be challenging to people, but they shouldn't be condescending. We became arrogant in our behavior. I think that it's important to also put it in a context which is not an apology for it, but a context. And that is that we live in a really decadent society, like Russia before the revolution, or China before the revolution, or Cuba before the revolution. But like a sewer, there's a tremendous amount of crime, a tremendous amount of backwardness, tremendous amount of individualism, competition, hatred of people. And that in this environment, male chauvinism or sexism plays a, as a value, plays a dominant an important, a leading role. One of the things that the government tries to separate the most, that you can't be a strong person and also a gentle person mm -hmm. at the same time, and that one of the reasons why the Vietnamese have been inspiring is that that's a revolutionary characteristic. Being strong does not mean shutting everything out and being a blockhouse, you know, which is sort of the American image of strength. Being strong means being able to draw on the best. Imperialism has as one of its underpinnings male supremacy. It's based on a system in which men are taught to think of themselves as superior. It's a bred into all of the institutions of society, into work, into the family, into schools, into hospitals, into medical care, into education. One of the hardest things was building a new culture. There's not an obvious alternative to sexist attitudes for men, for women, for children, for the whole society. It was really the women in, inside the organization who brought about these changes by being really challenging and firm and strong in demanding change and at the same time loving and open and encouraging about the process of change. The Days of Rage was an act of political violence. What, what was your next act? The next acts were all by the state. I mean, 300 of us were arrested. The conspiracy trial was going on. Bobby Seale was chained and gagged and dragged out of the courtroom. And uh, three weeks later, Fred Hampton was murdered and Mark Clark in Chicago. Bobby Seale is going through all types of physical and mental torture. But that's all right, because we said even before this happened, and we're going to say it after this, not that I'm locked up, not that everybody's locked up, that you can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail a revolution. Right. You might want to liberate like Eric Cleave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting. And if you do, you come up with answers that don't answer explanations that don't explain you come up with conclusions that don't conclude. And you come up with people that you thought should be acting like pigs, that's acting like people and moving on pigs, and that's what we've got to do. So we're going to see about Bobby, regardless of what these people think we should do. Because school is not important, and work is not important. Nothing's more important than stopping fascism, because fascism will stop us all. Someone came into the room, started shaking the chairman. The chairman, chairman, wake up, the pigs are laughing. Still half asleep. I looked up and I saw bullets coming from it looked like the front of the apartment. Um, when he looked up, he just looked up, he didn't say a word, he didn't move, except for moving his head up. He laid his head back down to the side like that. He never said a word, he never got up out the bed. The immediate violent criminal reaction of the occupants in shooting at announced police officers emphasizes the extreme viciousness of the Black Panther Party. So does their refusal to cease firing at the police officers when urged to do so several times. I heard a pig say, he's barely alive, he'll barely make it. I assume they were talking about Chairman Fred. But then, 
Uh, they started shooting the pigs. They started shooting up, shooting again. I heard the sister scream. They stopped shooting. Pig said, he's good and dead now. Sergeant Groth described the parade as 50 minutes of hell and a miracle. A miracle because not one policeman was killed. A miracle because not more policemen were shot. It's two and a half weeks since Fred Hampton was murdered by the pigs who own this city. It's almost a year since the massacres in Vietnam and the daily massacres that go on against the people of the world have occurred. And we want to announce that we're coming back to the loop, that for people to be able to enjoy Christmas time in this country without remembering and without making a choice about the struggle that's going on in the world, without taking action about a blatant murder that takes place in the city against a revolutionary black leader is an obscenity. And At that time, we were talking earlier about the corruption and uh, acquiescence of the American people, as well as the revolutionary traditions. And at that point, our political judgment was only to see the uh, corruption, only to see the acquiescence. Where are you going to march? Well, we'll march down State Street with the crowd. I mean, we live here in America, see? You know, we're born here in this country, too. And uh, the notion that we're outlaws has got to be put together with the fact that, that America created us. And uh, we're going to State Street where the rest of the rest of the people think they can they can go and, and be safe on if Christmas no, Eve day. If there's no room on the sidewalk, would you go out into the street? Sure. I think that we're we've made plenty of mistakes, and we're not a terrorist organization, and we're not an adventurist organization, and it's irresponsible of people to make that accusation. Of course, we make mistakes. Of course. Partial rebellions don't lead immediately to revolution. And to, to call those things, to f flatten those things out or to single them out and blow them up and say, this is it. No progress. You lost. You made this mistake. You're irrevocably branded. Is to strip revolution of the fact that it's a process. And the process is everything. And that Do you think it ever was a, an accurate criticism? I think that uh, we believe in self-criticism. And uh, we believe that it's a major way in which the revolution moves forward. We have responsibility to have a strategy that takes into account the ups and downs that it's going to go through and doesn't see only in the down an endless down or only in the up an endless up. It's going to be a struggle that peaks and then rests and gathers back its strength and learns from its mistakes and rises up again. And that's inevitable because of the violence that's embedded in the system. So the mistake was not taking into account the long road, the whole thing, and understanding how much work was going to have to go into organizing the people through every form of struggle and every form of resistance and every form of fighting back and focusing in on one means of the struggle. We don't agree with the criticisms of us that say you go too fast, you go too far, you're too violent, because we feel like that's always said of people who were fighting back, and that's always said, an accusation made against revolutionaries. We feel our actions have been responsible and accountable to the, to the struggles and to the legitimate demands for freedom and for liberation of most people. For a sex successful revolution to take place, um, the vast majority of people have to be involved in it and support it and uh, fighting in it. With some people doing, within that structure, different people doing doing different types of fighting, some people leading mass struggles, some people leading the armed struggle, um, and those things very, being very closely related. So that means that everything that we do is built around a strategy of trying to mobilize, lead, and or participate in those struggles. Our action has been against the property and the symbols and the institutions of the ruling class. At this stage of the struggle, it's armed propaganda. One copy was addressed to the Associated Press, one copy was addressed to uh, NBC, and one copy was addressed to the New York Post. I'm going to give you copies of the letters if you'd like. They have a logo. They say, this morning we attacked the Banco de Ponce in Rockefeller Center, a bank controlled by the multi-million dollar Ferrer Enterprises of Puerto Rico. Then goes on about the cement strike directly challenges the Ferrer family, which owns ironworks, hotels, newspapers, banks, and construction companies. Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States. 
What does it mean to be a colony? It means that the wealth of the island, its resources, and the labor of its people are brought back to the United States to the profit of the big corporations. 85% of all the industrial capital in Puerto Rico is in the hands of North Americans. 13% of the good land in Puerto Rico is taken up by U.S. military bases. The United States imposes on Puerto Rico its own language, a tourist culture of prostitution, big hotels, gambling, the destruction of agriculture which forces people off the land and makes them unemployed in the cities or search for employment in the United States, sterilization programs, a third of the Puerto Rican women of childbearing age have been sterilized. Viejo que has visto la isla perder sus hijos, are there guns to deal with genocide, expatriation? Are there arms to hold the exodus of borinqueños from Borinquen? We have been moved, we have been shipped, we have been parcel posted, first by water, then by air. El Correo has special prices for the low island element to be removed, then dumped into the inner city ghettos. Viejo, viejo, we are the minority here in Borinquen. We, the Puerto Rican, the original man of this island is in the minority. I writhe with pain, I jump with anger, I know, I see, I am la minoría de la isla. Viejo, viejo anciano, do you hear me? There are no more Puerto Ricans in Borinquen. Puerto Rico has a long history of great fighters for independence. For the working class and the poor people of the United States to free themselves, we must link up with the national liberation struggles, such as the Puerto Rican movement for independence. We must join it in full solidarity, embrace it as our own, for we have a common enemy. The letters were recovered at 10th Street and Greenwich. At this time, we have no arrests. We got the CBS offers. We get them frequently enough. And we don't know how to make a film or do TV and don't want to be cut in between two ads and uh, the evening news, you know, because then it's all appearance and it's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not what's really happening. It's not how people feel. It certainly seemed to us um, last night that it was more complicated and more difficult than we thought it was going to be. It was not so much having to do with the uh, difficulty of the uh, strange equipment or even um, that we're in a space which, uh, which we're not used to being in. I don't really feel like these, the words which, we, which, we're, we're, which we're shying away from are really rhetoric. Just because lar large numbers of people are not uh, comfortable with, say, a word like imperialism doesn't mean it's rhetoric. It means we have a, we have a job over the long run, which is to find some way to explain what imperialism is. We have no choice but to use the word. The same is true for racism. So, so rhetoric is, uh, is only rhetoric if you can't find a way to explain it, to make it make sense. I find all of this, you know, incredibly constricting and false for us to be able to express who we are. And I think it could be better if we were talking to each other um, with probably with the tape machine running, but not the camera running, because it requires us to get into these postures that are um, incredibly uncomfortable. If that machine were off, you could come and join us on the floor. We could... So the problem is we're making a film, and every time then we say, OK, now we're ready, we're going to start the film again, it'll be the same thing will happen again. And it seems to me each time we do this, and we're struggling to find the form of what we're doing. And as we sit and we do that, Hopefully, we're getting better at it, and we're beginning to get an idea of and relaxing and getting to know each other within this context, because this is the context that is going to go out. I feel like I've learned something in the last day, which is that I now know that I'm going to be uncomfortable through this whole project from beginning to end, and I thought I wasn't going to be. I thought I was going to be uncomfortable yesterday morning, like when we, we started, um, everyone has sort of 
given me some sympathy for being in a, in a difficult situation, but it didn't bother me at all because I, I knew it was going to be like that. What I didn't realize was that later in the afternoon it was still going to be like that. Now my right leg is asleep. <laughs> That's the way it's going to be. And um, all, of these, all of this equipment is uh, contradictory. Um, it can be used by the ruling class or it can be used by the working class. Just because we happen to be on the revolutionary side of the class struggle doesn't mean that it's going to be comfortable for us. Here we are, we're in a house, the windows are boarded up, we're all sitting around, it's very awkward, but we're trying to deal with the discipline of the situation. You've accepted the discipline of the situation, and we are willing to take the risk of doing this because it seemed like we could speak to a lot of people, and we do want to do that. And we, no matter how political and revolutionary we think we might be, are people who are making a film. There is that lens that stands between you and between us. There's no question that we're special. We're professional revolutionaries. And most people are not professional revolutionaries, and we're also fugitives. And so that's true. This is what makes the special situation. <laughs> yeah, of course. You yourselves know that you're a minority. Uh, as, as professional revolutionaries, always are at a certain stage in the development of history. What is the best way for us to make a film that moves other people, that moves many people to feel that they can make a revolution in this country? By telling us how you got there. You, a woman of a certain age in the United States, under these conditions, <clears throat> under these events, you reacted in this way. You had these fears, you had these strengths, you had these ideas, and so you've come to this place in, 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 in American society which I happen to think is a very good place to be in American society today. And how did you get there? And you can't say Miss X, born of middle-class parents in New York, is certain, certain. who the hell cares about Miss X? We're, we're scientists, we're professional, full-time revolutionaries, and, and we, we got this way for very specific reasons, political reasons. We study a lot, we think all the time about certain kinds of things. Anybody else could do that too, anytime they wanted. The, the point of view of television, of textbooks, of all of that is the point of view of the people who make money, who govern, who rule the country. Um, and so we're taught to identify with their successes or their failures. What we're saying is that it's a success or failure of masses of people. So it definitely is a combination of the pushing and pulling between us, I think, that's the only chance of making it work. I think that what we agreed about last night is that we would try to understand and get deeper into the questions that you want answered. That's why we're going to go into the explosion at Greenwich, in Greenwich Village and several other things that you think are important. We want you to be able to make a good film. You think that to be able to make a good film, this is the kind of thing that's necessary. So that we should do. It's not what we would portray if we were making a film ourselves. There's a poem written that's called, that was written after the townhouse, that was called What It Feels Like to Be Inside an Explosion. How long an explosion goes on, the rumble of it, it's that kind of time that can't be counted on a clock. It's that kind of time that seems to go on forever, and you have a chance to see your whole life in that moment, and also the lives of your friends. As far as we can determine, the uh, fire was caused by uh, an explosion down in the cellar. It blew out the uh, front and side walls, collapsed three of the floors, and it uh, uh, caused a severe fire and involved the whole building. There were two people who got out safely, and there's one reported still in there. It was a long dynamite explosion, and it tore the basement and the first floor of the house apart. We all could have been there and we've all talked about it and know what happened and we're part of what happened to the three people who died so the story of what happened there really is the history of the whole organization the people who were inside who survived um, fought their way out through uh, a, coll a collapsed floor that fell into a 20-foot hole uh, pitch black dust everywhere out onto the street. And see um, the fire, fire. The Everybody. fire was just starting as they got out of the house, and a crowd was already gathering. They had really only one 
uh, thing to do, and that was to get away from the area fast. So they went down into the subway, and they were broke, completely broke, it had nothing, and went through the turn, turnstile two at a time, the way people do in New York when they can't afford a token, and uh, got on the subway and immediately began panhandling enough money to get to the next stop. Everybody looked at the situation that night and decided this is it, and that happened in 10 different cities, 15 different cities. And from that point on, we were able to disappear, even though our pictures were on the front page of the paper every day for days after that. One of the amazing things in the days following was riding the subways or watching TV and seeing our, our pictures all around, knowing that we were being looked for and knowing that they weren't able to find us. People that we went to for help all took us in immediately and were really happy to see whoever knocked on the door and that part of it was actually a lesson to us about what we were talking about before about to the extent that we underestimated people or thought that people couldn't sort out the main things that were going on that was started to be proven wrong right away can you tell us a little bit about the people that were in the townhouse ted gold terry robbins and diana alton were three very courageous and beautiful comrades and they exemplify the intensity of the struggle at that point, the fact that people in this country have died for the struggle for freedom, also that people were willing to die, were putting their lives on the line around ending the war in Vietnam. Diana was a teacher. She um, does what she was primarily. She was that in a lot of different places, in uh, Philadelphia, in, in a remote Indian village, Chichi Castanaga, in Guatemala. She was also part of the women's movement. She was a person who knew her own mind. I thought she was a very uh, disciplined person. She also was a very strong-willed person, and she made her decisions about her life thoughtfully and carefully, and she did things with her eyes wide open. They all three did, and they had decided at that point in their lives to begin armed struggle in the United States. This was as thoughtful and as careful a decision on their part as anybody, as any revolutionary ever makes. That's when it becomes a soap opera about their lives. That's what's torn away from it, is the fact that people do make decisions like that and take their destiny into their own hands. Who, who chose Dylan's song? Terry chose that. Terry? Yeah, Terry was a, an aficionado of Dylan, a real fan. And uh, he picked that name. He knew every word to every song Dylan ever wrote. <laughs> Terry had dropped out of college at 16 to do community organizing in Cleveland, Ohio. Teddy had fought at Columbia and been involved in the Columbia struggle. Teddy was a New York-raised kid, played street basketball in New York, grew up in the New York public school system, a red diaper baby. He founded Teachers for a Democratic Society, TDS. You can still see today, five years later in New York, um, Teddy's handwriting all over New York. A very distinctive uh, bring the war home in the war in Vietnam. Uh, on the subways and walls on the Lower East Side. The NLF has won. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the first thing anybody did, and it wasn't out of the blue. So people had uh, become revolutionaries slowly, one step at a time, had gone to jail, had done all kinds of other actions before that. It, it's not mysterious in that sense. It came out of real people's changes in real people's lives. Every year on March 6th, we, uh, we stop and remember because this, this is of signal importance to us. It, uh, it marks the beginning for us of, of a period of being underground and in active combat. And it marks the ending of uh, three people's lives who we w loved and were intimate with. One of the uh, errors that I think was made among the people who were there that caused the explosion was that people didn't take their own safety into account enough and didn't see that as an essential part of doing any action or any struggle in this country and it's falling into a trap that's laid by the state of pe making people not feel like they're worthy or worthwhile. Each person has the responsibility for taking care, for being careful. They were trying to state their commitment in a total way without being careful, and that was a mistake. Mistakes were made, but
but we don't think that it should be used as a repudiation of the necessity for armed struggle uh, in order in the long run to uh, build a successful revolutionary movement. We saw going underground as part of building and diversifying and deepening the struggle and giving it a new aspect and element, which was the capacity to live and work from a space that wasn't under attack and wasn't under the eyes of the state day to day. This is a poem for Asada Shakur. She says of herself, I am a black revolutionary, and by definition, that makes me part of the Black Liberation Army. For Asada Shakur, underground is not the right word. It makes it seem too simple, as if there is an easy way to disappear, a place to go. Beneath the city streets, there is no safe passage. You moved among your people a gentle wind, invisibly winding into their lives, constrained a normal human response to daily injustice with an exhausting effort, a ballooning breath of anger caged inside, carefully choosing the moment of attack, and with muscles taut like the stretched skin of a drum, rode the subways between two businessmen studying your picture in the New York Times. Although we had never seen one another, I wondered how you liked to spend those moments when freedom meant you knew they didn't know. And during those last months when they hunted you hard, I was an invisible supporter working on another front, knowing of those tearing apart times when the days are like the flashes of a strobe light and the earth turns with a racing rhythm running the gorilla through the changes of a normal lifetime in a single month. And when you were captured, sister, I wept for all of us. What about a specific act of violence that you people have been involved in, like the Capitol bombing? Why did you bomb the Capitol? A person, a voice that sounded to her uh, like a male voice who stated in a low, hard tone uh, that you will get many calls like this but this is uh, real. This building will blow up in 30 minutes. Uh, evacuate the building. Uh, this is in protest of the Nixon involvement in Laos. We put a lot of work into um, our timing and our choice of target and our explanation for why we did it and, uh, and making sure that uh, that it would be an action that would reflect the sentiments and the views of the people who were all, who were in Washington at the time demonstrating and uh, and also uh, uh, in particular to call attention to the fact that Congress was just completely in uh, in Nixon's pocket. There was no uh, there was nobody in Congress that was taking an honest or a principled or a humane position on and and doing anything about ending the war in Vietnam. Can you give us any specifics about that action? How many people were involved in it? Uh, anything about the way you operated? I think it's important to say that people volunteer to carry out actions like this. Um, and people are chosen on the basis of political consciousness primarily. Did, I, did you catch my face just no, then, Haskell? I got, I got are you sure? Don't worry. We'll find out what, what happened. Several people volunteered to do it. To get past security, they, they, they had to carry it in on their body in a certain kind of way. And then, as they were putting, putting it in the place where it was supposed to go, it fell. There was a, a ledge where the people who did it thought there had been a shelf, and it fell several feet. And uh, when the people who were there realized what had happened and that they were still there, they took a couple of deep breaths and came out. And that evening, the uh, members of the organization made calls and uh, uh, alerted the press that this action was going to take place, and then it didn't happen. It didn't go off. The fall had uh, in some, some way affected it, and there was, no, there was no explosion. So the organization had a series of quick calls around the country and came up with a plan which was to uh, take a much smaller device and go back in and put it on top of the one that had been put there the day before sort of like a little starter motor. And the same people went back in again because the people who did it called in and already claimed that we're going to do it. The second time in was uh, tremendously more dangerous and more difficult. 
So they went back in and they, they put the little one in and it worked and it ignited the big one. The Weather Underground bombed the Capitol. They bombed the Capitol to bring joy, to bring joy to America, to bring a smile and a wink to all the kids uh, who hate the American government. We didn't do it, but we dug it. It was outrageous, uh, I think. It looks to me as if it was a planned explosion on the basis of where and how it was evidently placed. And I think it was a sacrilege because I speak not in a religious sense, but in a public sense, because this is the house of the people. from New York and I have a Vietnamese campaign ribbon, Vietnamese service ribbon, national defense ribbon, and a purple heart. My name is Peter Brannigan and I got a purple heart here and I hope I get another one fighting these motherfuckers. <laughs> Robert Jones, New York, I symbolically return all Vietnam medals and other service medals given me, given me by the power structure that has genocidal policies against non-white peoples of the world. Right on. All power to the people. This is for the brothers and sisters of Kent. Fall up with respect for our army, retired. I'm taking in nine Purple Hearts, Distinguished Service Cross, Silver Star, Bronze Star, Army Commendation, and a lot of other shit. This is for my brothers. Right on. We don't want to fight anymore, but if we have to fight again, it'll be to take these steps. I mean, what I would like to know, I mean, I'd like to know if people if people go around and f afraid that the, uh, uh, some a cop or some FBI man or some CIA man is gonna is gonna grab them. I just want to know if you walk around with that fear. Fear, yes. Every time, I, I think for all of us, I know for me, every time I see a policeman, I have this rush of adrenaline. And I take a defensive stance in a, in a, uh, a martial art type of sense. I mean, not a, not a fighting posture, but an alert posture. I remind myself who I am, what my name is, what my various numbers are, where I'm going, where I've been. That's an interesting way to live. Um, nervous every day. You wake up in the morning and you say, I wonder how many times I'm going to be nervous today because it happens every day. I mean, it's been five and a half years. We've all been stopped by the police. I, one time, a policeman commented that my hand was shaking. My, this was the first time my hand was definitely shaking. <laughs> and uh, he was really apologetic about it because he, his consciousness was the people hate the cops and I'm not so bad and don't be afraid. So he, like, apologized to me, you know, about the fact that my hand was shaking. I don't know. I had an experience I like to tell. Walking down the street in, uh, at night, about 10 o'clock at night, and, and by a counter a, uh, where you could buy a, a you know, fresh-squeezed orange juice, suddenly the uh, police cars come screaming up, and uh, four cops jump out with their guns drawn. And then the paddy wagon pulls up, and uh, um, in I go. <laughs> and we go about five blocks, and the back of the door is thrown open and uh, somebody's head sticks in and says that's not him <laughs> and uh, it was it was I just happened to fit the description of someone who was being looked for uh, for a, an alleged robbery and uh, so then the police and uh, offered to drive me home which of course I declined we have a very strong ethic that fear is an open subject and that when somebody's afraid in a situation um, they have an obligation to say so because it's often real. We assume it's based on a real thing, and we'll figure out later if it was right or not right. The other thing to say about the fear thing, I think, is that because of the nature of American society, a lot of people wake up that way. The state is around. It's everywhere. And the government uh, means no good by the people. It only means bad. It only means hurt and exploitation. I was a much more fearful person growing up in this society than I am now. Now the fear is real fear. It's not paranoia, it's not myths, it's not 
the fear of the unknown. People are made to be afraid of the wrong, of unreal fears, you know? This person is threatening me for a job, you know? My wife's freedom is my defeat. Your children become a threat to you, old people. And that kind of fear is much more terrifying. In the, in the underground as a whole, um, there has to be a high level of commitment to each other as people, even while we're working out differences, because uh, cause lives are on the line. And uh, the ability to uh, live a normal life is, uh, is gone. Um, and that has to be true for the revolutionary movement as a whole. Um, and, and it has to become true for everybody. And then there's the other side of it, which is that we definitely, um, we definitely feel good about what we're doing, about what we've done. And right now, I would be pretty hard to feel any better because uh, we say it that uh, that we feel that the victory in Vietnam is a victory for the American people, and we certainly identify it as a victory for ourselves. It's something we fought for for ten years, and. Um, I don't know, I'd, my, I'd have to have my foot run over by a police car to feel bad today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what the hell is essentially a white, middle-class, revolutionary group doing in America in the year 1975? Well, there's, there's two things involved. One is class origin and one is class stand. The class origin of many of us is intellectual. And that means that we have a lot of barriers to overcome in terms of developing full revolutionary consciousness. That's true of anyone who wants to become a revolutionary in any country at any time. There's a constant struggle to, it's a lifetime struggle, to remake yourself, to take on the awesome task of revolution making. The other thing is class stance. And our class stance as revolutionaries is solidly with the working class. We came out of the student movement, and we came from the working class and from petty bourgeoisie, and a few people came from the ruling class and left the ruling class background. But the overwhelming re reality about who are the people in the United States is that the people work. The people work for a living, and they have to work for a living, and it's the only way they can survive. We're a white organization for historical reasons, and it won't, we won't always be that way. And certainly the people who make the revolution, the organizations and the forces that make the revolution, will be multiracial and multinational. On a little press, a half a million pieces of paper went through that press. We kept the press running the way uh, people used to keep Model T's running. It's a 156-page book. We did 5,000 copies, and every page was collated by hand, gloved hands, and that was a piece of work. So our attempt was to try to describe United States as we saw it, and underneath that to explain the forces at work, which made sense out of that. So it didn't seem like pure chaos, but actually you could understand that there were forces in struggle and change happening in the world, and that the people in the United States were a major part of that, and that their government was a major part of that. The other thing about it is that we felt if we could describe that, write down the ideas as best we understood them, and put them out, that they would get changed by putting them out. We knew that if we could just risk putting out what we did understand, that we would learn a lot more from it. It would be changed, it would be criticized, it would grow. Three quarters of the copies were distributed across the country in one night, so we had to set dates. I just remember the feeling, I remember feeling as excited about that last week of July last year when Prairie Fire came out, as I did about the time of the national action, <laughs> the days of rage, because it was that total of mobilization of our forces. Uh, and when you reach a point where the entire group is mobilized to act in concert, it's a very stimulating time, and it's one in which you really feel your, your power. And rather than working for somebody else and trying to see how much you could lay down on the job, you were working for yourself. And it was a tremendous experience, the coming together of this Red Dragon print collective. We just started our own newspaper. It's called uh, Osawatomie. Osawatomie is the, the name that was given to John Brown. I mean, it wasn't just a one-shot thing, because we want to put out our own propaganda. I think one of the things that 
makes our print shop a communist print shop besides the work methods and the way we have organized production and the fact that no one's making any profit is, uh, is, the, is the unity of the whole thing. We wrote it, we figured out how to make a book, we made a book, and then we got it out. When we started, we had never done any of those things, so we had to learn how to do all of that in order to, uh, in order to get the copies that we put out. We spend a lot of time writing and a lot of time licking stamps, and some of it is particular to the underground. We don't have an address where people can write to us, so we try to get it out as widely as we can by mailing it and leaving it around in places where we think people would like to see it and hope that it'll be reprinted and used by people in their organizing work and talking to their family, their friends, the people they work with. When you're putting forward the uh, idea of revolution, you have a responsibility to build in from the very beginning the realization that no revolution can take place successfully without an armed confrontation with the, with the state. The imperialist power will fight as long as it can with the most advanced technological weapons that it has. And I, and I feel that uh, pacifism and nonviolence becomes an excuse for not struggling, for not fulfilling what I feel is a human obligation in this world to, uh, to bring about revolutionary change and to destroy the imperialist system. I think it's a common mistake to think that violence is a choice in political matters. Violence exists in certain social situations, and it's not a question of choosing to be violent or nonviolent. I think you could start by saying, who created this wealth? You know, where did this incredible technological and industrial power and potential come from? Because that's one of the best-kept secrets. You know, Rockefeller acts as if his family made this wealth. Um, of course, is the people that made the wealth. People built the railroad and died building the railroads. People opened up the farmland and people produced the food. People created the giant industrial capacity that exists. And at every stage of that work, the wealth was stolen from the people and gathered in fewer and fewer hands. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. There were any way to make a revolution without violence. We would be for it. But nothing in history, nothing that you see in society around you would lead you to that conclusion. This society is organized on profit. That's the assumption. And that profit doesn't just come because some people are smarter than others. That's a theft. There's the violence. That's the roots of the violence. And I think the only way of ending a violent system is by tearing it out by the roots. That's a radical solution. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving mid the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. We do think there's a tremendous distinction between the American people and the U.S. government, a tremendous distinction. We believe that the American people can confront all the backward ideas and backward things about this culture and this society, overcome them, become a force for change, and bring about that change. But it won't happen by wishing it were so or by proclaiming it. It will only happen through direct struggle and confrontation. 
We no longer wish to be treated as statistics. We want to be treated as human beings. You can hear the people. One of the most beautiful movements has been the prison movement here. When you see Rochelle McGee stand up day after day and refuse to be broken, although he spent 10 years in prison for a completely trumped up crime, he speaks for black people, he speaks for oppressed people, he speaks for me, he speaks for everybody in the world. He refuses to be broken and in the most incredibly repressive situations, this kind of spirit coming out and demanding dignity dem ends up being a demand for the whole thing, ends up being a demand that we abolish this system, this society altogether and build a new one. We are men. We are not beasts and we do not intend to be driven or beaten as such. The entire prison populace has set forth to change forever the ruthless brutalization and disregard for the lives of the prisoners here and throughout the United States. What has happened here is but the sound before the fury of those who are oppressed. We are not advocating violence. We are advocating communication and understanding. The Attica brothers themselves uh, were generous in every way to the guards who were incredibly racist. You know, these are not token gestures. These are, reflect the whole fabric of the difference between the future society that's really trying to eliminate institutionalized violence in a necessarily violent confrontation. find I agree with an awful lot of what everybody's been saying as far as the violence of this society and but it's very hard to say anything when you haven't done anything about it well it's not a personal question I mean I guess that's what we had to figure out it seems somehow like a personal question and everybody does have an individual reckoning with themselves and the question of human life but it isn't a personal question there are of many levels on which to uh, people can can activate themselves and resist and and there's not only one way to uh, oppose things and in fact um, in order for it to be successful it has to be sustained and that means building a a process of struggle and a lifetime of resistance not just a single flashy act or a single moral statement but a long consistent commitment well I think the revolutionary forces have an obligation to be ruthlessly honest with themselves and not put forward that we're bigger or stronger than we are and also to have a accurate understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of the enemy so that we're not afraid to act how many people are in your organization? Well, we're a very small organization relative to the task to be done. Um, and we can't discuss exactly the size. But as you know, we're small. But we don't feel weak. As we m have moved around the country, we've been helped in many, many ways by many people. It's not a trick, you know. We're not, we don't exactly outwit the FBI. So if people didn't support there being an underground, we wouldn't be here five years later. We feel that it's part of what our job is, is uh, and this, this is a job that's going to take our whole lifetime and longer, is to help people have a, uh, a clearer understanding in order to, uh, to be armed through politics to create a revolution in the United States. I want to ask you about the war in Vietnam. Do you think that that contributed to the, uh, the unemployment that exists at present? Yes. Uh, uh, Out. And all these people that they're bringing in from over there, Cambodia and Vietnam, yeah, they're giving them checks right over the bat and a place to live and everything else. Why don't they take care of their people right here at home first? They got people right here, if not eat, eating dog food.
our job as revolutionaries is to be involved in the day-to-day -day struggles of people for survival, for simple things, as well as implanting the idea and the possibility and helping to take shape the necessity for complete revolution, for socialism, as the only way, really, to solve that day-to-day -day struggle for survival. The things I want out of life, they're so small, I can't even have them, you know? $80 every two weeks. What can you do with $80 every two weeks? Nothing. What, what do you do to survive? Survive. Just... <laughs> you borrow money. When you get this, you owe everybody, you know? Uh -huh. So. I, you know, I wonder in the next five, six years, you know, what's what's going to really happen? What do you think? Do you think that people are going to begin to get together here? I do. You know, eventually I believe there will be a revolution. I really do. I hope I'll be around to see it. I hope I will <laughs> <No. you> too. <laughs> but uh, it's coming. I can feel it. It's coming. I can see it. If this country had been more like it was before, I wouldn't think about socialism. But the way things have, uh, you know, progressed now, this is what's getting me to think a little bit about it. What does socialism mean to you? What do you think about when you see, think uh, the, of socialism? Well, uh, unless I'm mistaken, because as I said, I don't know too much about these things. Uh, but it, it means that uh, people would be more balanced out. In other words, instead of having, uh, there's so many people who are making so much money here, there, and everywhere. They have their fingers in all the pies, you know? And some people just can't seem to do anything. They, they don't have the opportunity, I guess. Maybe uh, we weren't smart enough, I don't know, but sometimes you do, just don't have the opportunity because I'm in a capital. When you look for an explanation, there's only one explanation. Some people work and barely get enough to survive, and some people make the profit off of other people's work. This is a class society. When there's a class society, inevitably you're going to have class struggle. And that class struggle may not always be apparent and visible, and it may not always unite with its true allies. But it can't go away. It won't go away. It keeps coming back. We're not fortune tellers, and I don't know how soon a revolution will happen here or exactly how it will happen. But it does reveal itself more and more every year so that you can, the forces at work that are going to make a revolution become clearer and more conscious of themselves and their interests. I can take no $2 job. I can. I cannot live on that. No two fifty dollars job. I can live on that. And nobody can make, you know, nobody can live on a $2.50 uh, $2 an hour job. That's why I've been so long without a job. More and more people are raising the question of dignity and how is work organized, for whom is it organized, raising the question about the disorganization of capitalism, that it's inefficient, that it's cruel, that it's violent and it's wasteful. And we can envision, and millions of people are at a, at a place where they can envision that things could be organized differently. Political revolution, that's what we need. What we're seeing, rumblings of all over the country, although these rumblings are localized and, and uh, isolated from, from each other at this point, is the beginnings of an organized attempt to fight back. And what we see in the future is really a torrent of rebellion leading to an organized ability to resist and fight back and ultimately to the organized ability of the working class to take power in this country and reorganize the whole society in their interests. Socialism. Why haven't the popular struggles in this country been more successful? Why hasn't there been a revolution? One of the main reasons, well, well the main reason, is that the people are divided against each other. The people who run the country are very good at this. They, they've been managed to turn men against women. They've managed to turn white-collar workers against blue-collar workers. But mainly, for 400 years, they've managed to turn white people against black people. Nowhere is this more clear than in Boston. Venom. I wonder about the tight-faced, work-worried women in cloth coats and curlers who collect in surly women crowds, spitting hate in Birmingham or Boston. I worry about their sullen spite collected in years of shabby schools and sometimes jobs, 
poisoned and prodded by habits, by fears, by landlords and leaders who revile them, provoked and pitted against their enemy's enemy. What turns class hatred inside out, freezes a longing for freedom into splintered cries of ice to pierce the heart of those black people who properly are allies. What is the bridge to you? Our struggle must reveal it. If you really have confidence that revolutionary change is a possibility, uh, full upheaval, revolutionary change is a possibility, then you have to believe that there is this tremendous potential and promise that people can be better. People can be better and can change and can transform themselves from all the backward negative values that are imposed upon them and that are handed down generation to generation through the culture and in several other ways, they can change and become revolutionized and become better. But that doesn't happen by wishing it were so. It happens by a challenge to that. You know, if you looked at it purely in a pragmatic sense, you could look at it and say, schools are worse. Black children are beaten up and attacked now just like they were 15 years ago on their way to school. Um, now it's just moved from the south to the north. But the other way of looking at it is that a black child growing up today has an incredible advantage compared to a black child 15 years ago. The difference is I am somebody. The difference is we are people and we have dignity and we have this history and we know it and uh, consciousness. A, a real obligation of, of revolutionaries and perhaps long before the U.S. got out, long before France was defeated at the NBN Fu, the revolution was won when the people became a people for themselves. And that, that same process will be true here. Before it's obvious on the face of it or on the surface that a giant transformation is going to happen, it will have already been concluded in terms of the hearts and minds of, of the masses of people. There's a relationship between, an important relationship between having a vision of revolution and a vision of the future and an understanding of what human beings are capable of and what's possible and the grasp of the work that goes into making it happen not skipping any steps, organizing people, bringing people together, forging demands, making a revolutionary program, identifying the enemy. Mao talks about this as he says, without dreams, there would be no work, there would be no toil. And without toil and work, there would be no dreams. Both dreams and toil are part of what make up human beings. And the dreams of, that people have, the visions that people have of what could be better, affects their work, changes their work, transforms their work, and the work that they do makes possible their dreams. We think of communism as the highest aspiration of people because we don't think of communism as the loss of self in the mass. We think of communism as the discovery of self in society. And it's inconceivable to me that, there, that any advanced notion of human capabilities and human possibilities would conceive of human beings isolated from each other or living on islands. We are, after all, in a social world and we realize ourselves, we become our best selves in relationship to other people. And communism to us represents opposition to the atomization of people, the ripping of people off from each other and the coming together of sisters and brothers, really. That's why, we, that's why we keep using the word communism and that's why we call ourselves communists. And the reason we're an organization and the reason we keep insisting on that, and the reason we keep insisting that we're not speaking here as, as five individuals, but are speaking from a collective, is because organization embodies within itself collectivity and, and embodies opposition to individualism.